Now, Second Samuel that we're coming to now opens on a note that we need to note very well, and I did not mean to make such an ugly pun at that point. This book, by the way, that we're entering now of Second Samuel, it's full of David, as the New Testament is full of Christ. It's given over entirely to the reign of King David. And we find in First Kings some records of the few declining years and death of David, but we have the life and times of David here in Second Samuel, and they are important because he is the ancestor of Jesus, and he's the type of the Lord Jesus as king, and also, friends, he's a great king, a great man, and we can learn many spiritual lessons from him. And also the book of Psalms was largely composed by David out of the experiences of his life that are recorded here. And again, that makes this all important for us, by the way. Now we're going to meet many new characters in this book. And they are characters that you and I ought to get acquainted with. And we're going to have now, in the first ten chapters, the triumphs of David. And they're going to be wonderful, by the way. And then we're going to come to the troubles of David, chapters 11 through 24. And they were innumerable, and they were a result of his sin. Don't tell me that God's people or David got by with sin and that God did not rebuke him and judge him for his sin. All right, now that brings us here to chapter 1, and I still have the question, who killed King Saul? We'll bring another suspect before us, even if it doesn't answer the question. So let's look at this. Now it came to pass, after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had abode two days in Ziklag, it came even to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent, earth upon his head, and so it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. Now this is the picture. This is a dark day in the nation Israel. War came to these people. And friends, when these people are in war, when they're having their troubles like this, it's because they're out of the will of God. I'm not sure that one of the reasons that we thought at the end of World War II we'd brought peace in the world, and we expected to rest on our laurels and enjoy life in sin far from God because that's the way the United States moved after World War II. And you know something? We haven't had a day of peace since the war ended. It's just been continual war for us. I wonder if maybe there might be a lesson here for us, that a nation or a people or an individual will have turmoil. There'll be warfare. There's no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Isaiah said that three times. I wonder if that might not be applicable to us today. This was a dark day for Israel. And you can see the position they're in. King Saul is dead. Jonathan and the other sons of Saul are dead. They have lost the battle. The Philistines have taken all that northern area around Galilee. And now here in the south... David didn't even know what had happened in the battle. He's been down recovering his own people from the Amalekites, and he's come back to Ziklag. He's been there two days, not having word. And finally, here comes a man, all disheveled, covered with mud and dirt and rent clothes, and he stumbles into the camp, and he says, I've come from the war and the Philistines have won, and King Saul is dead. Now he tells something that's quite interesting here. Listen to him. David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, That the people are fled from the battle, 
And many of the people also are fallen and dead, and Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan his son are dead? And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked, Behind him, he saw me and called unto me, and I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I'm an Amalekite. He said unto me, Stand, I pray thee, upon me and slay me, for anguish is come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen, and I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm, and have brought them hither unto my Lord. Now this Amalekite, did he actually come upon the body of Saul, find him dead, and then took the crown and these marks of the king, these things that he wore, and bring them to David? Or did he actually come upon Saul and Saul was not yet dead. I'm of the opinion that when Saul fell upon his sword, that he still was not dead, that there was life in him. And when this Amalekite came by, he asked him to slay him, and the Amalekite did it. And the interesting thing, he comes and confesses it to David, and he expects David to give him a medal for it and put him on a life pension. And notice what happened, though. David took hold on his clothes, ran him, and likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until even for Saul and for Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord, and for the house of Israel, because they were fallen by the sword. And David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I am the son of a stranger, an Amalekite. Now you see, if this man did slay Saul, then Saul, when he disobeyed God in not slaying all the Amalekites, he let them go, he made a big mistake, because this is the man who slew him, and he might have lived. And David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? You remember, David wouldn't touch Saul. He said he's the Lord's anointed. It's well sometime to see things from God's viewpoint. And as long as King Saul was king, David said, I won't touch him. No one else better touch him, because God is the one who put the crown on him, and God is the one who will take it all when the time come, and David would not touch him. And you know that it's a dangerous thing today, friends, to interfere with God's work in many ways. I could tell you some very interesting stories about some folk that have attempted to interfere with God's work, God's program, and God's man. And God moves in and judges today. He's always done it. David said here to him, Weren't you afraid to stretch forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of his young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. Now David judged this Amalekite. Now listen to David. David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth hath testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. Now, if this man made that story up and made this confession, it certainly was a fatal thing that he did. And David says, If you have lied to me, then your blood's upon you, because you confess that you kill the Lord's anointed. I'm of the opinion that he really had done that. But be that as it may, this Amalekite is judged. He did what David would never have done. David would never have touched King Saul. Now, David's grief is revealed here, and friends, it's genuine grief. David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. And this is quite a very moving thing. Also he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it's written in the book of Jasher. Listen to this now. 
Saul had taught Israel something. He'd made really a contribution. You see, these people had no weapons of war. We've seen that. No iron weapons. Saul had taught them to be bowmen. That is, taught them to use the bow and the arrow. And that was quite a weapon, by the way. Many of our ancestors would testify to that were they here today. That's what the Indians used to hold them back and win many battles, by the way. And here is this lamentation. It really is a thing of beauty, by the way. And here's real grief and sorrow. The beauty of Israel is slain upon thy high places. How are the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath. That's the capital of the Philistines. Publish it not in the streets of Ascalon. That's in the Gaza Strip. That's still in Philistine country. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. Ye mountains of Gilboa. That's up in the north where the battle was fought. Let there be no dew, neither let there be rain upon you, nor fields of offerings, for there the shield of the mighty is vilely cast away. The shield of Saul, as though he had not been anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. And you could not say that Either Saul or Jonathan were cowards. And after all, Jonathan and David were bosom friends. They loved each other. And David's grief is sincere. Listen to this. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives. And in their death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Ye daughters of Israel, weep over Saul who clothed you in scarlet with other delights, who put on ornaments of gold upon your apparel, and he had brought prosperity to that land, you see. Now listen to this, and here is a real note and touch of grief. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? O Jonathan, thou wast slain in thine high places, I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. By the way, that's quite interesting. And I'll tell you why it's interesting. Because David was married to the sister of Jonathan. And she actually, as we'll see a little later, she betrays him. I think she loved him as a hero at the beginning. That came the day when she despised him. And this man, David, was not too successful in his love affairs. As we have said, Abigail is the only noble woman that I find in his retinue. And I disagree with those who think Bathsheba is so outstanding. I don't think so. Someone says, well, it was David's sin. It was, absolutely. And God judged him for it, as we're going to see But let's understand one thing. What was she doing out on the roof parading around like that? May I say to you that it's David's sin. We're not trying to apologize for him. But we are trying to say that David was not successful in his love affairs. And as a result, he could say of Jonathan that here was a man who was true and loyal to me unto death. And the interesting thing about David, though many of the women were unfaithful to him, The men that were his followers were loyal to David to death. He had that charisma that some men have of having followers that will stick with him. And David was that type of a man. Now, the last verse says, How are the mighty fallen and the weapons of war perished? This, my friend, is a tremendous tribute to Jonathan in particular, as you can see. And David's grief over the death, particularly of Jonathan, is touching, and it's poetic, and it's dramatic, and it's one of the most striking lamentations that we have in the Word of God. Now we're going to see 
next time, David is made king over Judah. And Abner, who was captain of Saul, he made Ishbosheth, Saul's son. Now, not all of Saul's sons had been killed. Though all of them that were in the battle were killed. But this was a younger boy. And Abner made him king over the remaining 11 tribes. And, of course, civil war broke out. And David defeated Abner and the army. And we find that after a long civil war that weakened the nation, David finally became king of all of the 12 tribes. And we'll find that he made Hebron his home at first until finally he moved up to the place that he loved above all others, Mount Zion. That's where his palace was ultimately built. And we're going to follow David now through this particular section of the Word of God. Now, here in chapter 2, I begin reading at verse 1. It came to pass after this, that is, after the death of Saul and Jonathan and the grief of David for that, that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. And David said, Whither shall I go up? And he said, Unto Hebron. Now, this is all quite interesting, for you may wonder, well, why does David ask the question? He's in the Philistine country. Saul and Jonathan are dead. David is to be the next king. Now, what will be his move? He waits until he gets instructions from the Lord. David has learned that he must wait on the Lord in a very definite way. Now I read, So David went up thither, and his two wives also, Ahanoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, Nabal's wife, the Carmelite. Now, you'll notice David takes up these two women who were his wives at this time. Someone is going to say, does God approve of two wives? No. The fact of the matter is, all of this is going to cause David a great deal of trouble because he has other wives also. Now, as I read, and his men that were with him did David bring up, every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, that the men of Jabesh Gilead were they that buried Saul. Now, here we have something else that we need to know. Yes, that David went up, and his mighty men went up, and God told him to go to Hebron. Hebron was on the border. He was down in the Philistine country actually not too far from here. And God is telling him to move cautiously, not to go up and arbitrarily take over, but to move up into the land to make himself available. And when he does, we find that the tribe of Judah makes him king. Now we have in verse 5, And David sent messengers unto the man of Jabesh Gilead, and said unto them, Blessed be ye of the Lord, that ye have showed this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him. Now, David does a very wise thing. The men who buried Saul were men, naturally, who were devoted to him. And David now thanks them for it. Because after all, David had a great respect for the anointed of the Lord. He had two opportunities to slay him and make himself king, but he did not do that. The good points of David apparently are generally passed by because the sin of David obscures everything. It's like a cloud that covers the sky and shuts out the sunshine that is in his life. David was a very wonderful man. This was one great sin in his life that he paid for every day of his life after that. Now he compliments these men. Now we are told, now the Lord had showed kindness and truth to you. David now is complimenting these men. 
and I also will requite you this kindness because you've done this thing. Therefore now let your hands be strengthened. Be ye valiant man, for your master Saul is dead, and also the house of Judah hath anointed me king over them. In other words, David asked for their support and for their devotion to him as king as they'd given it unto Saul. And you notice that he's moving in a very diplomatic and, I believe, a very commendable manner at this time. Now, we recognize that Saul and also Jonathan had sons, and they would be the normal ones to come to the throne had not God intervened. And Abner, who had been the captain of Saul's host, moves immediately to make one of them king. And notice what he does. Verse 8, and I'm reading it. But Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim, and made him king over Gilead, and over the Azurites and over Jezreel, and over Ephraim, and over Benjamin, and over all Israel. Here is the beginning of the division of the kingdom, which will come after the reign of Solomon, when Jeroboam leads a rebellion again. But here is the fracture at this time. At first, David is made king over the southern kingdom of Judah. But the ten northern tribes now make Ishbosheth, who is a son of Saul, make him king. And what happens? We're told that the house of Judah followed David. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Now, this was an interval of civil war. That is, War between the northern kingdom and David and Judah in the south. And it depleted the resources and the energy of the nation. It was indeed a very tragic sort of thing. Now will you note what happened? And Abner the son of Ner and the servants of ish the son of Saul, went out from Maonabian to Gibeon. And Joab the son of Zeruah, And the servants of David went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon, and they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. Now they were attempting, first of all, by negotiation to work out something to prevent a civil war. But as you well know, and certainly we in this country ought to have learned by now, that when you have folk on one side who are determined on one course and people on the other side determined on another course, that negotiation is practically valueless. It's generally an exercise in futility. And that is exactly what this will be. Now, you will notice verse 13, And Joab, the son of Zeruah, and the servants of David, went out and met together by the pool. They sat down. One on the one side, the other on the other side of the pool. Abner said to Joab, Let the young man now arise and play before us. And Joab said, Let them arise. In other words, let the young man now come together. Then they arose and went over by number twelve of Benjamin, which pertained to ish the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. And they caught every one of his fellow by the head, thrust his sword in his fellow's side, so they fell down together. In other words, they were going to let this be the way of settling it. It was a sore battle that day, and Abner was beaten in the men of Israel before the servants of David. They tricked David at the beginning, but David was prepared for this type of trickery, and so he immediately was able to engage him in battle. Now, actually, you have a veteran of many campaigns now. David is not the little innocent shepherd boy that we met at the beginning. He's now a veteran who has spent time hiding in the caves and dens of the earth, who's collected men of war around him. 
And he's a rugged man now, an adept at this type of warfare. And so he was able to get victory over Abner and the host, that is, a superior number. Now you have an incident that took place, and I merely call attention to it because it is to play a very prominent part a little later on. Azahel was following Abner, and Azahel was a brother of Joab. This man Joab was David's captain, and Abner was Saul's captain. And he's the one that's leading. And Abner said to him, Turn thee aside to thy right hand or to thy left, and lay thee hold on one of the young men, and take thee his armor. But Azahel would not turn aside from following of it. In other words, Azahel took out after Abner, and Abner turned around and said, Quit following me, wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? How then should I hold up my face to Joab thy brother? And he was no match for him at all. And finally, Abner turned around and drove a spear through him. And that means he's killed the brother of Joab. Now that means that in Joab's heart, there will be this bitterness and hatred and a desire to get revenge. And it will come later on. Now that is the end of this chapter We have the funeral of Azahel, and Joab and his men went all night. They came to Hebron at break of day, and they reported to David all that had taken place. Now we are told something in chapter 3 of the family of David in Hebron, and here's where I want you to see something that is all important, by the way. I read in verse 1 here, And this is important for you and me to note. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. This is the condition. Internal strife, civil war, and the nation's energies are being depleted And, of course, their resources are being exhausted at this time. Now we're told that while David spent this seven and a half years in the city of Hebron, we're told in verse 2, And under David were sons born in Hebron, and his firstborn was Ammon of Ahanoam, the Jezreelitess. His second was Kileab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, and the third, Absalom, the son of Maaka, the daughter of Talmai, the king of Geshur. Now you can see David had more than the two wives. He had these others. And this will be the thing that's going to cause a great problem for David. David didn't get by with this, and God did not approve of it. And we find that among these boys that are listed here is one by the name of Absalom. And I'm sure you're familiar with his story. A little later on, we'll see him lead a rebellion against David. We'll see that this is the boy that was brutally killed by Joab in battle. And that this young man was apparently the one David wanted to follow him to become the king. I'm of the opinion that David wanted this boy to be the one to follow him. And it broke his heart when he was slain. But who is he? Well, he's the son, we're told here, of Maacah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. Well, who's the king of Geshur? Well, if you go back into 1 Samuel, in the 27th chapter, verse 8, you will find out that when David, had gone out of the land that he carried war against the king of Geshur. And I think he was in the wrong position altogether and doing a wrong thing. And he slew these people and the king of Geshur, but took apparently his daughter to wife. And this son is the one that led the rebellion against him. David, my friend, did not get by with it 
and God saw to it that he did not get by with it at all. This is something very important for you and me to know that he did not get by with it. Now we have something else that happens in this chapter that is of great significance. This is a long civil war and in many ways very uninteresting as far as you and I are concerned. Now what happened was this, that Abner, who had been the chief captain of King Saul, now he's been pushing the son of Saul, Ishbosheth, on the throne. And naturally, being an older man and having had such a high position, he's not apt to listen to this young king, and he does something that he should have been forbidden to do. Now, notice we're told that. Verse 7, And Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Wherefore hast thou gone in unto my father's concubine? Then was Abner very wroth for the words of Ishbosheth, and he said, Am I a dog's head? which against Judah do show kindness this day unto the house of Saul thy father to his brethren and his friends, and have not delivered thee into the hand of David, that thou chargest me today with a fault concerning this woman. In other words, Abner saying, this is none of your business. I'll do as I please. And he did not appreciate the rebuke that the young king has given him. But Candidly, the young king is justified in the thing that he's saying and in the thing that he's doing here. Now we are told that immediately Abner begins to make overtures to David. And the thing that happened is this. We are told in verse 9, So do God to Abner and more also, except as the Lord has sworn to David, even so I do to him. In other words... This man says, I'm going over to David to translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel, over Judah, from Dan even to Beersheba. And that would include, of course, the twelve tribes. And he could not answer Abner a word again because he feared him. Now, this young man, Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, he had no army and he had no training. Whatsoever, He was not like Saul and Jonathan, the oldest son. He was one that had been brought up in the king's palace. Now, Abner sent messages to David on his behalf, saying, Whose is the land? And he says, Make a league with me. Now, David said this to him. He says, In verse 13, Thou shalt not see my face, except thou first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, when thou comest to see my face. In other words, she was the one that was given to him at first, the first wife, and Saul took her away from David. Believe me, this man David had a checkered career. My friend, this is the reason God wouldn't let him build a temple. And the reason that this man suffered as he did is because of the sin that entered his life. But above it all, there was a faith in this man's life that never failed. And he wanted, above all else, to have a wonderful relationship with God. And so Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, even from Phaeltiel, the son of Laish. And her husband went with her along, weeping behind her to Behurim. Then said Abner unto him, Go return, and he returned. Now we find that there is this overture made, it is accepted, and we find now that David will become king of all twelve of the tribes because actually of the treachery of this man Abner. Now, Joab hasn't forgotten that his own brother had been slain. And so we read, When Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly and smote him there under the fifth rib, and he died for the blood of Azahel, his brother. Now, when David heard it, David did not approve of it at all. In fact, the matter is he accused Joab of doing a very terrible thing. But the thing that he said concerning the death of Abner 
is quite interesting. And in closing, I'd like for you to notice it. In verse 33, And the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner as a fool dieth. Now, why did he say that? That's a strange epitaph to give any person. Died Abner as a fool died. Well, he was in Hebron. Hebron was one of the cities of refuge where a murderer was safe. And this man, Abner, if he'd stayed inside of the city, would have been perfectly safe, and Joab could not have touched him. But Joab very quietly took him aside and says, Come out here. I want to talk with you. Now that you are, were captain on the other side, I'm the captain over here. Oh, why, it'll be nice if we get together. And so he attempts to get together with him, and he kills him. Well, may I say to you, he had left the city of refuge. Is that a message for us today? There is a refuge for the sinner. That's in Christ. You want to know God's evaluation of the man today? And I don't care how high his IQ might be, and I don't care what his position is. The man that will not turn to Christ in these days, he's the place of refuge for sinners. David said of Abner, died Abner as a fool died. And if the truth was told at many funerals today, the preacher or whoever speaking would have to say, a fool has just died. He would not turn to Jesus Christ, the place of refuge. Today, are you resting in Christ, the place of refuge? Now today, friends, we come back to the fourth chapter of the book of Second Samuel. And we're dealing with troubled times for the nation Israel. It was a time of internal strife, civil war after the death of Saul and Jonathan. And it was a time of great heartache and heartbreak for God's people. This is a section of the Word of God that's usually passed over. But it's given to us, I'm confident, for two reasons. To show us the family of the Lord Jesus, to give us his genealogy. And the second reason is that we're told, Paul tells us, All these things happened unto them for examples unto us for a very definite reason, and they have been given to us in order that they might minister to us in a spiritual way. And that's what we are anxious to note here. Now, we saw last time that there had been a rebellion against David, He'd been made king of the tribe of Judah. He'd moved into Hebron, just at the edge of the kingdom and in the south, and he was there. And that Abner had led a rebellion by putting a son of Saul on the throne, ish But because this young king reprimanded him and rebuked him because of his position relative to taking a concubine of Saul, why Abner then went over to David. And he made a big mistake there because there was a man over there by the name of Joab, and he was waiting for revenge, for Abner had killed his brother. And he lured him out of Hebron, the city of refuge. If Abner had only stayed there, he'd have been safe. But He was lured out by Joab, and then Joab slew him. And we saw last time that David gave the strangest epitaph that any person could have. Died Abner as a fool died. Why? Well, he left the city of refuge. He had salvation, and he wouldn't accept it. He wouldn't receive it. And he had moved out. How many people today are dying like that? God's offered a salvation. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him. Now, you have to believe in him. God loves you. But you will have to accept Christ if you're to be saved, because he goes on to say, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I think this is God's viewpoint. God says a man's a fool today that a die without Christ. That is the position of God, not mine. I'm not saying that to you, but that's what God says to you, and I don't care who you are. 
because this is the position of the lost today who will not turn to Christ, and all of us are lost until we do turn to him. Now, you will notice as we come here to this fourth chapter that this young man, ish now has lost his captain, the military, and he knows he cannot maintain his kingdom against David without the military. And his captain has been murdered. And beside that, he'd already gone over to David. And so what he's to do? In chapter 4, I begin reading at verse 1. And when Saul's son heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands were feeble, and all the Israelites were troubled. And Saul's son had two men that were captains of bands. The name of the one was Baana. The name of the other was Rechab, the sons of Remon, a Barathite, of the children of Benjamin. For Baroth also was reckoned to Benjamin. And the Barathites fled to Gitam and were sojourners there until this day, that is, until the time that Second Samuel was written. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old. When the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel, his nurse took him up and fled. came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. Now, that's an unusual name, but you remember it, will you? Because in a few days now, I'll be coming to Mephibosheth. And here is one of the most beautiful stories that was ever told about David. Now, you see, Mephibosheth, as long as he lived, was a constant danger to David because he had throne rights. He was a son of Jonathan. But since he was a son of Jonathan, David would never harm a hair on his head. And later on, David will go looking for members of the family of Saul and Jonathan, not to slay them, but to show kindness to them, to reveal that he actually loved them and did not hate them at all. So the thing that will happen will be just simply this, that he will finally locate Mephibosheth. And everyone expected him to slay him, but he brought that crippled boy into the palace, put him at his own table, and he ate there and he told him, said, you'll have free board and lodging the rest of your life. And he protected this young man the rest of his life. May I say to you, this is an act on the part of David for which he should be commended. It's so easy to criticize David. And I think we need to recognize the one who criticized him the most was the Lord. The Lord judged him, friends. But David had many very wonderful traits. This was one of them. Now, in that, we'll see a great spiritual lesson You and I have been showed kindness because of another. You see, David loved Jonathan, and it's for Jonathan's sake that he exercised kindness. You and I have been crippled by sin. He covers us with his righteousness, and because of another, because of what Christ did for us, God accepts us and receives us. What a beautiful picture we have here. I call your attention to it because we'll be coming to it later on. But now we follow this story, and it's not a beautiful story by any means. And I'll be very candid with you. I don't care where you follow man's story. It's not a pretty story. Look at our contemporary culture. Do you see anything beautiful and fine and noble around you today? So let's not be too critical of this particular period. This was a great period of crisis. It was the transition from the kingdom of Saul to the kingdom of David. There had been civil war. There had been rebellion, you see, during this period. Now when these two underlings who were petty officers under Abner in the army of Saul discovered that Abner was dead and they recognized the strength and the power of David at this particular time, they conspired to put this boy who is a son of Saul to death. And they made a big mistake, by the way, 
in doing that. And so when Ishbosheth was in bed, why they slipped upon him and they slew him. And it was a bloody, ugly thing. Now they expected by doing that that they could make peace with David and that David would actually reward them for this. And so they immediately took the head, imagine that, of this boy over to David. Well, David was not even about to accept it, friends. He would not in any way approve of that. In fact, these men had committed a murder, and they had murdered a king, and he executed them summarily for doing this dastardly deed. David now is king over the land. He exercises that authority. But yet the ten tribes, or actually it's really the eleven tribes, because at this particular time, even the tribe of Benjamin, which later went with Judah, this tribe was the tribe out of which Saul came. They were with the tribes in the north. And so actually it was eleven tribes against one. Now those in the north recognize they no longer have any leadership. And there's no one to assume authority. And there's foolish to carry on this rebellion at this time against David. And so they now attempt to make overtures for peace. Notice how they do it. And that brings me here to chapter 5. And notice this. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron. That is, they sent representatives, of course, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. And that was true. And that's the thing that made this civil war as terrible as it was, because those people were fighting among themselves. I personally think the greatest and worst war that this country fought was the Civil War. I think that as you look back at it today, it was almost something that was unnecessary. It was the hotheads, the protesters in that day that got this country in trouble. And that's the reason I'm opposed to all hot-headed protesters. I don't care what side they're on today, because that's the crowd that got this nation in trouble way back yonder. It was not the man who actually fought the war like General Grant and Abraham Lincoln and Robert E. Lee. They found themselves in an awkward situation. And you can still see the vestige in the carryover of that war that was fought actually over a hundred years ago. And yet the scars are still here. And so this was a great civil war that had been carried on. Now the nation is to be united under David and to enter the greatest period that this nation has ever enjoyed in the past. And it'll be typical of the day that Christ comes and rules. Now will you notice what we have here? All the tribes now come to David through their representatives. Listen to verse 2. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, thou wast he that ledest out and broughtest in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, thou shalt be a captain over Israel. Well, they are rather late in getting around to acknowledge that David was the legitimate and the right ruler over these people. And they should have recognized this before, but belatedly they've got around to it now, and they recognize him. So that all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron, before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. Now this nation is ready to enter its greatest period of prosperity and expansion. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah, which actually means he reigned 40 years and six months. Now notice the first move that David does. To consolidate the kingdom, he moves the capital from Hebron up to Jerusalem. 
verse 6, And the king and his men went to Jerusalem under the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. They underestimated David again. David was a great military leader and a great leader politically and a great king. And most of all and best of all, he was a real man of God. Now notice this. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. Mark that in your Bible. I've marked that in my Bible, and you know why? Zion was David's favorite spot. The city of Zion is the city of David. And if you've ever been to that land and to the city of Jerusalem, you'll recognize that it is the high point of the city. Actually, in David's day, Jerusalem was way down near the valley of Kidron. They have found the walls that went around that particular city at that particular time. And it's way down below. Actually, the present city of Jerusalem is up near Mount Zion. And yet it's in the Israel side, actually. And it's not a part of the old city. Here's where the palace of David was built. And later on, below him, that's where the temple was to be built. David chose all of this. Now, Zion and Jerusalem was David's city. He has many psalms that tell us about Jerusalem. And very frankly, it wouldn't be my favorite city. I agree with David on many things, but not on Jerusalem. Pilate hated this city, and he only came up there during the feast days. That's the reason he happened to be there at the Passover when the Lord Jesus was arrested. He was there to keep order. And when it was over, he retired to Caesarea because he loved it down there on the Mediterranean. And I'll be very frank with you, I think I would much prefer that than Jerusalem. But as far as the Bible is concerned, Jerusalem is yet to be the great capital of this earth. And I'm delighted to know that I'll not be living there in eternity. I'm going to be in the new Jerusalem, and it has a much greater vantage point than the earthly Jerusalem. But we need to note here, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David, you see. What he did, he moved and took the top of the hill, and not the city proper. And from that vantage point, he was able to take this city of the Jebusites, and they found themselves overwhelmed before they knew that there was a battle going on. Now we read here, verse 8, And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites, and the lame and the blind that are hated of David, so he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Now David here is doing something that apparently is the result of his years of out yonder roughing it. And David was a rough and ready individual, by the way. Now, keep in mind, God would never let him build the temple. So don't become too critical, because God is the one who judged him. And we need to remember, even believers should recognize this one of another. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he stands or fall. And I have no right to sit in judgment over you. You have no right to sit in judgment over me. And now I am going to have to stand before God as a believer. My works will be tested, and yours will too, my beloved. Not for salvation, to see whether you're going to receive a reward or not. Now, since I'm his servant, and you're his servant, then I'm not your servant, and you're not mine. Therefore, we're not to judge each other on that basis, you see. Now, let's not judge David, because God already judged him. And I want to tell you, God took him to the woodshed and gave him a good whipping. We're going to see that. Now, we are told in verse 9, So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. That was Mount Zion. And David built round about from Milo and inward. And David went on and grew great. And the Lord God of hosts was with him. And Hiram, king of Tyre, 
sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David a house. Now, you see, when he moved up there, took the city, why, he now has a wonderful friend in a man up there in the north, and that was Hiram, king of Tyre. And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. And Hiram recognized that David was an outstanding man. So he worked out with him an arrangement whereby he supplied materials and workmen to build him a palace. And we're told, verse 13, And David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron, and there was yet sons and daughters born to David. Now, that is the record of the facts. It's not God's approval because it's here. We'll find out it was definitely God's disapproval. And in his son Solomon, it eventuated in the splitting of the kingdom today and finally really brought on the Babylonian captivity. Why? Because this man is king. He's in a place of leadership. And this is wrong. Well, who says it's wrong? God says it's wrong. And after all, this is his universe. He makes the rules. If you don't like them, well, I don't know about you, but most of the rules of God are pretty good. The fact that God today has put us on a universe and he sticks us on here with scotch tape. We today have another name for it, but it is one of the laws of God that you're going to just be helped to this earth and you can't get very far away from it. It'll pull you right back down. And that's a law of God, by the way. He has some good rules and regulations, and after all, he made it. It's his universe. Now, will you note here that we find something that we need to note in particular. And these be the names of those that were born unto him in Jerusalem, Shemua and Shobab. Now, I know nothing about those two boys. And Nathan and Solomon, but I do know something about them. From the line of Nathan came Mary, the mother of Jesus. From Solomon came Joseph. And from both of them, the Lord Jesus got the bloodline and the legal title to the throne of David through Nathan and Solomon. And that's the reason that it's recorded here for us. Now we find that David carries on here in a monotonous sort of way, this war with the Philistines. But when the Philistines heard that they'd anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hole. And we find here that there was war between David and the Philistines. Never was there peace.